Welcome to Breathe California TV. Breathe California is a lung health organization for the state of California. Each week we present a show generally focused on pre preventing damage to your lungs. Uh, this week we're going to be talking with State Senator John Laird, who has an enormous district that goes from uh, San Jose down to Morro Bay in San Luis Obispo County. Um, he seems to be on half the committees the legislature has, so we will have no problem with things to talk to him about. So stay tuned. We'll be back in 30 seconds. My name is Renee Montez. I've been using the CPAP machine, I would guess, uh, 10 years. I, I got so accustomed to it, I don't uh, go anywhere without it. I take it with me everywhere. From the moment I put it on, um, I thought it was the greatest thing because the breathing was a lot easier. And um, I, after using it for a couple nights, I felt uh, a lot of energy. Green California is fabulous. <laughs> Welcome back. This is Breathe California TV. Breathe California um, is having its annual uh, fundraising walk on October 8th in Hellyer Park in San Jose at 10 a.m. I'm the chair of the whole event, so you should show up just to make them think I have some clout. Um, so we're going to start talking to State Senator John Laird. Um, welcome, John. It's nice to see you. It's been so long. Uh, great to be here. Thanks for having me. So I'm joking about so long. Two days ago, John um, was master of ceremonies for an event in Soledad that I had the good fortune to attend. And I didn't get a chance to tell you there, but about three days before that, some um, television network had a wonderful interview with you, which you explained um, about what was relevant to be doing these days on monkeypox. And I thought it was very thoughtful Last night, John Oliver had a whole show on um, monkeypox, and uh, essentially the message was the same one that you delivered on um, local TV. So appreciate that. Um, the show called Vice, a national TV network, had a 15-minute um, program on the Diablo Canyon nuclear plant, which is in your district. And um, you said it was giving you some ulcers on Saturday. Um, so what's the situation with that? It's scheduled to be closed in 2025, but there are interests on both sides that want to keep it open and closed. Um, how do you cope with that as the state senator from the area? Well, the governor has proposed or is about to propose keeping Diablo Canyon uh, open for a number of years. As you said, it's scheduled to close in 2025. <clears throat> and it's been my uh, view that there's about 10 major issues that have to be addressed in the governor's proposal for it to be viable. And for example, it's going to cost hundreds of millions of dollars to keep it open. Where's that coming from? Is that coming from the utility rate of payers? Is that going to come from the federal government? They have a pot of money uh, potentially for extending nuclear power plants. Uh, the legislature passed a bill that the governor signed a few years ago to transition away for San Luis Obispo County. They rely incredibly uh, on the economic benefit that comes from Diablo Canyon. And in fact, the school district that includes the plant would lose 10% of its property tax revenue if the plant were to close. And of this money that was helping with the transition, $80 million has gone out. So do people have to pay it back? Is it just good? If the plan is extended for five years, does that mean there's no money when it actually phases out? Uh, offshore wind, is going to phase in off of Morro Bay and San Luis Obispo. And the question is, is the transmission that's necessary for the 
uh, a wind energy that's generated, will it be available if Diablo Canyon extends? There's 12,000 acres of land surrounding Diablo Canyon that uh, many people wish to preserve for accessibility and, and for other reasons. What's going to be uh, the fate of that? There have been seismic studies that show that there are new earthquake faults that have been identified that are closer to the plant offshore. There's been extensive seismic uh, work, but uh, none of the upgrades or not all of the upgrades were made because the plant was closing in 2025. Is that going to happen now? Um, a lot of the workers have started to retire and move away. Is there an adequate workforce? They only have enough fuel through 2025, and they only have enough cask storage for the spent fuel till then. Is, is that going to be... Uh, 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 added to the whole mix. And, and there are more issues. Uh, uh, there's deferred maintenance. And because it was closing in 2025, a lot of the deferred maintenance was not addressed. So is the governor going to present a plan that addresses all those issues? And in fact, it, this has been considered a settled issue. There were long negotiations, stakeholders were involved. Uh, there was an agreement signed. That's what's in force. So there's a lot of things on the table. And for me, as the legislator, I want to see what the governor proposes. And I want to see that he addresses all these issues. And, and I'll look at what I might do if he addresses all the issues. And if he does it, I think I'm going to ask him to address the issues. So that's just, um, the believe it or not, the short answer of where it is right now. Well, as usual, uh, you've brought up a whole bunch of things that we ought to consider a good laundry list. Uh, the argument that was being made on the national TV news program, Vice, was that we needed for climate change. Um, nuclear power plants have little, if any, um, emissions. Um, how would you balance that against safety risks, which obviously are concern for people? Well, the I didn't adequately explain the governor's motivation here, and he believes that uh, by the benchmark of a hot September day, we don't have enough energy with what we have done or plan to do in the next few years to meet the need. And there could be a times that the, the grid goes down or isn't adequate, and that's the real thing that his his motivator the uh, some of the renewables have not come on as quick as they uh, have there's the phase out of some of the fossil fuel plants as well as the uh, nuclear power and it's his view that there's not going to be enough energy on the grid on certain days and that's the reason to do this and it is being reduced to a choice between there's these fossil fuel plants known as once through cooling plants that take seawater out of the of the ocean cool the plant put it back that's once through cooling with the the seawater and so it's fossil fuel it's, it's considered not clean and we are either way trying to face out once through cooling and Diablo Canyon uses once through cooling for for its processes and it's being represented by some of the advocates that it's a choice. Uh, we're going to be short either way and choose nuclear as more clean than uh, the fossil fuel once through uh, cooling fossil fuel plants. And so I think I have some colleagues, I've participated in meetings with them, that say, why aren't you drilling down on every single other uh, option, such as reducing <clears throat> reducing demand at peace times, uh, making the grid more efficient. And, and the interesting thing is, is that while there might be problems in, in the next two or three summers, Diablo Canyon is authorized for three more years. Uh, uh, this is about what happens after that, not in the next one, two, or three years. So it's a big debate. And it, the legislature may be asked to do something before we go out for the year on the last day of August. And so that's the challenge that we have is trying to uh, uh, vet all these uh, uh, factors and see what the right thing is to do. And this is completely separate. There are a lot of advocates, Mothers for Peace, 
uh, others in my hometown of Santa Cruz that just believe nuclear power is not safe, particularly near earthquake faults, and it should be phased out now, not even 2025. So you have that on the countervailing uh, side of the debate. So uh, I understand you chair a um, climate change committee in the Senate. Uh, any of um, these issues come up there or is the climate change concerns that might benefit the use of Diablo Canyon not real relevant in the discussion? Oh, it comes up in very related ways because my take is, is that if this were to be extended, uh, you need to have a fixed end date and not a rolling one. But the key thing is if it's being extended because we don't have enough renewable energy on board, then we need a Marshall plan for renewable energy in the time that's bought by it being extended. So it is very much related. And the climate working group in the Senate is a group of 12 senators. And last year, we did not have a particularly good year on climate policy. We had a great year on budget and fire and water and some of the things that need to be done, but not on the policy. So the Senate president said, I'm gonna appoint a 12 member group and we're gonna cut across political divides and geographic divides and ethnic and, and gender divides. And we're gonna to try to hash it out. And we had 22 meetings, nine of which were stakeholder meetings with labor, building trades, environmentalists, environmental justice, utility operators, local government business. We really tried to bring everybody to the table and see what their issues were. And by the time we're all done, we have a 13 bill package that tries to deal with uh, interim goals, a climate trust to lower utility rates, good labor agreements to, to make sure that labor is is adequately involved in this process, speeding up electric cars and trying to transition the transportation sector, creating a climate dashboard so everybody can go to one place and see what uh, uh, where we are with our emissions. And, and we moved that package out of the Senate, all 13 bills. So we have that going with the governor doing Diablo Canyon and the governor also coming in and saying, he wants light action on climate. So we're really, um, yeah, we really have a lot going on on climate in the last few weeks. And it is related to all this. Absolutely. Um, so Al Gore made the tour of national TV programs two, three weeks ago on climate change. And he said, uh, we really need to get going and in particular attack places like my own city, Palo Alto, you would think would be um, pretty enthusiastic about climate change reductions, but um, we get to zero emissions by counting a whole bunch of offsets that we bought from San Joaquin Valley farmers. And Gore said, uh, you need to really be at zero, not by buying a bunch of offsets. So. It's uh, pretty clear we're going to need a nice package of solutions. So we'll look forward to seeing the 13. So we're going to switch um, and talk to John. You have, um, I've forgotten from the speech, I remember either 24 or 34 bills that you have in front of the legislature now. So in 30 seconds, we'll be back after another public service announcement to talk to John about those. So stay with us. The different therapeutic methods that we can help our um, very low socioeconomic status um, clients who have no alternatives, no, no anything, and they, there's still about 15 different resources we got out of this that if you have no resis, resources, no service connection, you can still get aid. That they are connected, one encourages the other and that the process of change from backing off from the tobacco is the same as backing off from any other addictive drug. Everyone can benefit from this training that we just were offered today. I would not take it back. Welcome back. I'm Terry Trumbull, a volunteer for Breathe California. If um, you want to help us out, so we're uh, assisting about 150,000 people a year with breathing difficulties. 
just uh, go to 408-998-5865 or the website lungsrus.org under my name and uh, give us a call and come volunteer. So John, um, Breathe California views its mandate as um, trying to take on emissions energy to reduce the amount of contamination we're inhaling into our lungs. Any of the bills that you've got working through the legislature um, going to help or hinder that? Yes. And uh, interestingly, two of the 13 bills that are in the climate package really address that. And I think <clears throat> the biggest bill, it's the biggest bill in the climate package, it's the biggest bill I'm doing, Senate Bill 1020, really says that uh, in, we have loaded all our climate programs onto electricity rates because electricity is cleaner and cleaner for the lungs than fossil fuels. And yet for people that are lower income or middle income, uh, that means they're carrying a lot of the climate programs. And so we have proposed a climate trust that would attempt to lower the rates uh, uh, for lower middle income people to really try to deal with the fact that that, that is part of our climate program. And we are uh, looking that state operations be uh, carbon neutral by the year 2030 and inciting renewables or siting transmission, which is key to better air and uh, less carbon emissions. W right now, there's confidentiality between the agencies, between the Public Utilities Commission and the Energy Commission and the independent system operator that runs the grid. And this bill allows them to share information for faster siting of, of uh, renewables or uh, transmission. And th though that is the biggest bill, and, and it is very important. And so, uh, uh, and we also have a, a goal of 2040 being carbon neutral in general. And, and this sets out interim goals to kickstart this and get to the electricity. And I also have a bill I alluded to earlier, which is the climate dashboard bill. Right now, you have to go different places to find out what our emissions were in a year or what things were, and it would allow the Air Board to put it all in one place. So at any time, you could log on and see, here's the progress we are or are not making toward uh, lowering emissions. Here's what we're doing on a whole host of our climate programs, and you can uh, take the measure and, and you can do it. And so those are the two uh, biggest ones that affect that. So the three bills that you mentioned, are they part of the 13 bill package that you mentioned on climate change? They are. And you see what the package is in general is there's also parts on electric vehicles. Uh, Senator DeRazo has, uh, has a bill on high road labor so that for the largest projects, there's a specified labor protocol for, for uh, uh, how workers get paid well and do these jobs. And then there's just different things because we have to move in a transition and we're not moving quick enough. We're moving quicker than maybe the other 49 states, but we're not moving as quick as we need to be moving to match what's actually happening in the climate. Uh, I led a delegation of senators to Vancouver during the break, and I was unaware that they had their own paradise uh, uh, last year, and when they were having a heat dome, it was a small city. It was 250 or or 300. It's called Lytton in British Columbia. It's north of Whistler, which is north of um, Vancouver, and they had a fire just take the entire town in the middle of that that uh, heat dome. And so here we are, we're having heat domes, and, and we're having fires all over the universe in my home area in Santa Cruz. We had the one that came almost to the city limits two years ago and and uh, just far be. When I was secretary of resources, the CAL FIRE director said that uh, that it used to be when he started out his career, that one fifty thousand acre fire was the big fire of the year. And then the last year we were there or the next last year we had 50 
I mean, we had five 50,000 acre fires, I think before we were out of June. And, and that last year was the year of the Paradise Fire. So there are really, uh, uh, everything has changed. And for those that say we're not in the middle of climate change, we are in the middle of climate change. We're in the middle of the impacts and we're getting there, not being able to reverse the tipping point. And that is the key reason that all the things we've been talking about in this broadcast are in play. So uh, we've been talking more in the abstract about reducing air pollution. Um, obviously, wildfire is an ungodly disaster. And you, like uh, probably the majority of the state Senate, have uh, districts that have to worry about it. Do you have any specific bills that you're carrying um, other than just generally reducing um, climate change emissions that would take on the wildfire issues? I did last year and it was signed into law. And, and what happens is, is that the state does what's known as fire mitigation or fuel mitigation programs. They have prescribed fires, which for years, everybody known knew as controlled burns. There is vegetation management, there's forest management, and it, it's trying to figure out how we prepare for these fires. I mean, in, in my home area, uh, when the CZU fire ravaged the Santa Cruz mountains, there's one place that they did a prescribed fire at the top of the San Vicente Redwoods above Davenport, uh, west of Boulder Creek. And the locals actually give credit to where the prescribed fire was for limiting damage to some houses or some areas, because when the fire came through, it just had a different pattern where there had been prescribed fire. So last year, uh, uh, because I identified as the former resources secretary that we, we just, our fuels mitigation program was whatever we put in the budget for, for a year. And the Natural Resources Agency, which I used to head, actually has a plan for what you do in five years. So I did a bill that said, we will put the five-year plans into statute. We will require that they be delivered. We will have a group that adaptively manages. Uh, it's been up to the newspapers to try to cover how well we've actually done what we did. This will actually require a disclosure. So if we say we're going to treat 90,000 acres, then there'll be a report on how that treatment went and whether all 90,000 acres were treated. And so it's a way to sort of aggressively plan and act and do it over a number of years and be able to, to measure whether we successfully met our goals with what we did. And the governor signed that into law last year. I spent uh, 15 years as the chief judge for the Bay Area Air Quality Management District. And um, you may not run into it, but we had three or four um, local uh, bodies going to us trying to get permits to start up prescribed burns. And what the law said is they had to get permission from the local air district. And when they got turned down because it was thought to be too severe an air risk, they brought them to us. I think we backed up the air district in every case. But has there been any plane with that that you're aware of? Yes, in different ways. For example, uh, there were whole issues about liability for prescribed fire and people weren't doing it. And so last year we addressed that to try to make sure that people would do it uh, in part because of what you just said was your history. Um, when I was resources secretary at the end and it was completed under the new administration, it's not so new anymore. Um, we did a statewide environmental impact report on fuels management that leads to prescribed burns so that you didn't have to do an individual environmental impact report for all the larger issues. You might for some of the issues that were specific to the site, but it removed all the larger issues so that in fact, it made easier the environmental project uh, process because when we're in paradise after the fire, they 
were going to all their residents to um, ask if they wanted to sign up and then be included in the environmental work to do fuels management for the year. One of the interesting stories is when the fire approached, they had printed all these notices and they went out and, and stored them in a car and the notices survived, but the printing house burned down in the uh, <laughs> uh, in the fire. And I thought the notices were going to burn up. Well, the interesting thing is, is most of the people that the notices were going to no longer uh, had a home that was up and uh, uh, had fuels that needed to be cleaned because the fire ravaged their their yeah. home, their property. And so um, that is where the process has been. And there's been an attempt to expedite the process so that we don't get balled up in process when you're trying to deal with something that's such a life and death issue of, of fuels management. My recollection is Governor Newsom said when he first came into office that he wanted to cut back on rural living, that uh, fires were um, creating severe risks for people that chose to build out in rural areas. Did anything ever come up from well, that? Well, he suggested that, but the thing about it is, is that of California's almost 40 million people, 10 million live in or adjacent to high fire hazard zones. Yeah. And so in some ways that's closing the barn door after the cow got out. And so the question is, what do we do with the 10 million people that live in or near the high of fire zones to make sure they're protected. We can argue about future, but right now uh, we have a major issue with who's already there. Well, as you know, I um, headed a state environmental agency for six years. And um, by the time that you became resources secretary, which I wanna say is 2013, um, the name of the Department of Forestry had been changed to the Department of forestry and fire protection that fire issues have become so much more prevalent and it's even known more as cow fire and there were a lot of us that were worried about the word forest or forestry being taken out of the title so uh we've got uh, about 30 seconds left do you have any summary of uh, all the brilliance that you've uh, discussed with us? I think uh, uh, everybody just has to pay close attention. Uh, and, and if you have strong opinions on climate, weigh in with your elected officials because uh, uh, people forget that in this crisis, we really have to meet it. And it's really good for people to tell their elected officials what their personal ex uh, experience is. It's a pleasure to have been with you today. Thanks again, uh, John. Keep up the uh, good work. We appreciate you in Sacramento. Thank you very much. Thank you.